So I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, I'll give you the official bio first. Dr. Patricia Richards, Professor of Sociology and Women's Studies, holds the Josiah Meigs Distinguished Teaching Professorship at the University of Georgia. She's an affiliate faculty member with the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Institute and the Institute of Native American Studies. She received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in 2002. She's the author of multiple books and articles. Some are Pobladoras, Indígenas and the State, Conflicts Over Women's Rights in Chile, Race and the Chilean Miracle, Neoliberalism, Democracy and Indigenous Rights. And her forthcoming book, co-authored with Rebecca Hansen at the University of Florida, is called Harassed, Gender, Bodies and Ethnographic Research. And that will come out in 2019 by the University of California Press. It's also my honor to have um, Dr. Richards here. We were colleagues at the University of Texas. I'm a cultural anthropologist. She was in sociology. We shared uh, committee members, but we also shared um, a project of doing collaborative ethnographic research with indigenous communities, with others, in trying to dismantle the or authority of ethnographic research. And for me, she was there earlier than me, but she was someone who is also a collaborative scholar and really helped me through the PhD program, shared her research with me, um, and so has been someone I've also collaborated with. We've published things together, and I think that's part of mm -hmm. thinking about feminist research is this idea of collaboration, co-knowledge production, decolonizing research. So it's my honor to welcome her and have her give this talk here at Stony Brook. Thank you so much um, for, having, for having me, I'm, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really grateful to Melissa for facilitating this um, talk and also to the numerous co-sponsors. It's really great to be able to share this work that Becca Hansen and I have been, have been developing together. Um, so, as Melissa said, my talk this afternoon will draw from a book project that I've been working on with Rebecca Hansen, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Florida, but who was a grad, um, a PhD student in our department at uh, the University of Georgia. And the project really provides a case study of sexual harassment in one part of academia. Ethnography could be classified as sort of an amorphous workplace, right? Because, because it is work that we're doing, but we're doing, when we do ethnography, we're doing it all over the world. Um, you know, in urban environments, rural environments, in the US, in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa. Um, and so, you know, it's not a sort of normal workplace, right? But nevertheless, the work experiences of ethnographers are structured in part by the norms, standards, and practices uh, of the academy. And so that's really what we're interested in thinking about in this project. So our objective um, with this project has not been to think about um, to think about women's experiences with sexual harassment in the field in order to come up with a series of tips and strategies for how to deal with it. But rather, we are interested in looking at women's experiences with sexual harassment as a means of interrogating the epistemological assumptions or foundations of ethnographic methodology. Um, the findings that I'm going to discuss with you today are based on 56 interviews that Becca and I did with a diverse sample of mostly women and a few men. Uh, the women in our sample experienced different types of sexual harassment and other unwelcome behaviors in the field, ranging from light flirtation and sexual banter to assault and, in one case, rape. My discussion today is going to focus on the women we interviewed, less so than the men, but I'm happy to talk in Q&A a little bit about, about why we interviewed men and, and what they had to say, if anyone's interested. So, <laughs> that's funny, that came out a little bit differently than I meant. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so. We, Becca and I identify three intersecting standards solitude, danger, and intimacy 
that our participants made recourse to when talking about disciplinary expectations for the quote unquote best ethnographic research. We refer to these standards as fixations because of the importance that was placed on them by the women we interviewed and their perception that these are fundamental standards held by the larger ethnographic community or the larger scholarly community. So again, we do not focus on women's experiences because only knowledge produced by women is structured or negatively impacted by these fixations. Rather, by examining the experiences of women ethnographers, which, like those of non-white and queer scholars, have been marginalized in the dominant canon, we can better identify and understand underlying assumptions about the construction of ethnographic knowledge. So I'll now, now turn to discussing the three fixations and how they shaped how women responded to unwelcome sexual experiences in the field, beginning with solitary research. Elena, a Latina associate professor, described an occasion when, as a young grad student carrying out fieldwork in Mexico, she turned down an invitation to dance at a party in the small rural community where she was working. Later that night, the man, accompanied by some others, came to the house where she lived alone. They attempted to enter, presumably intending to assault her. She managed to open a window and scream, and her neighbors came to help. Now, Elena never told anyone about this experience, except for her husband. And she reflected, I think the idea at the time with anthropologists uh, was that you have to be on your own, basically. And I felt that I needed to deal with it. Elena's belief that she needed to deal with it suggests an understanding of ethnography as a trial by fire, as if withstanding the difficulties of conducting ethnographic research alone by yourself is what makes a good qualitative scholar. The valoration of solitary research or solitary fieldwork does not exist only in the minds of the women we interviewed. It was reinforced in their coursework and also by the ethnographies that are commonly held up as exemplars in their disciplines. Now, several participants talked about the idea that being a good ethnographer meant doing anything for the data. A belief that worthwhile ethnographic research requires facing danger in the field is the second ethnographic fixation. Some mentioned losing perspective in the field and engaging in behaviors that they wouldn't in their everyday lives. So once when Gina, who is a white graduate student, was conducting field work for an advisor's project in Latin America, Doug, who was an expat and one of her, one of her participants, hit on her at a bar, touching and trying to kiss her. Later, she went to the bathroom. when she went to the bathroom, a man who she didn't know tried to assault her. She escaped and turned to Doug for help. Though he expressed anger at what had happened, he continued to try to touch and kiss her. Gina reflected. I was like, oh God, Doug, why are you putting your arms around me? Like I'm here to do something and I need to do this thing before I leave. I need to make sure I have the good data. I can't go home and tell my advisor I didn't get anything, that I failed. And I also think while I'm doing ethnography, I put my mind in this mode of like recording everything because I'm trying very intensely to remember every detail because I know I'm not taking notes until after the fact. So Gina here is pointing out that oftentimes the awareness that many women develop as they're socialized is muted while, while conducting field work due to a desire to get good data, but also in the process of concentrating to get it all down. Another reason that participants reported pushing their instincts and safety to the side was their perception that dangerous ethnographies are the ones that are most glorified and rewarded in academia. 
So Lena, an Asian American grad student, noted that these rewards are often overlaid with race as well as gender, with white sociologists going into presumably dangerous settings in African-American or Latino neighborhoods, most often held up as the star ethnographers. The glorification of dangerous ethnographies not only puts researchers into danger, but also reproduces the exoticization of marginal lives, leading to knowledge that, as Victor Rios has written, has more to do with the researcher than the lives of those they study. So ethnographic intimacy, or becoming as close as possible with research participants by spending as much time as possible with them, was a key evaluative benchmark in our participants' minds as they entered the field. And this is our third ethnographic fixation. But for many, getting close to their participants meant coping with assaults on their identification as researchers as well as as independent women. It meant care work and ego stroking and even placing themselves in situations where they had to fight off sexual advances or assault. Phoebe, a white sociology student working in Latin America, explained, me doing a good job as an ethnographer means that I'm intimate and having people share everything. But it opens me up to, well, you should have expected it, Phoebe. You are hanging out with this guy until nine at night. But it's like I'm taught that I should want him to want me around, right? She laughs. What? I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is having these strong connections with these people in the field. And that's what everyone wants, right? That's the goal. Right? So in Phoebe's case, when she eventually told her advisor and peers that her gatekeeper had propositioned her, many responded just as she alludes, by questioning her behaviors and suggesting that she should have expected it. So this is the very same logic that's used to keep women silent about harassment and violence in other settings. Phoebe reflected, I wish we had more honest conversations about the double-edged sword of intimacy and how I'm expected to get it all, but it can very easily be used against me in ways that aren't problematized or thought about at all. So this is not to say that intimacy is not a contested standard in fieldwork, as other scholars emphasize the importance of things like trust, rapport, and boundaries instead. Still, intimacy is frequently held up as the approach that can create access to the best data, even as it opens up the researcher to unwanted attention or advances, and also blame and critique when these do occur. Moreover, as Laura Rico has pointed out, the emphasis on the body as a tool with which ethnographers can achieve intimacy elides the different challenges that researchers will encounter precisely due to the ways, the, precisely due to their particular embodiment and what their particular body signifies <clears throat> to others. So Rebecca and I proposed two interrelated expl um, explanations for why these fixations might have stuck with the women that we interviewed, becoming particularly salient when negotiating these problems in the field. First, the ongoing dominance of the white heteropatriarchal perspective in academia has a silencing effect on women after they have experienced unwanted sexual contact in the field. As Eva Moreno writes in describing being raped by a research assistant many years ago, a central aspect of academic life is the denial of gender at work, such that if we bring up issues that are specific to us as women in the academic context, we run, we run the risk of doing damage to our identities as scholars. Now, graduate school often teaches silence around these issues, and these silences are inflected again by race as well as gender. Recently, 
Elizabeth Armstrong and her colleagues in the um, Annual Review of Sociology, and Maya Berry and her colleagues in an article in, I think, Contemporary Anthropology, have written about these silences in two really important articles that I encourage y'all to read. And Becca and I really see ourselves in um, conversation with them. Bridget, a black sociologist who we interviewed, observed that she learned to be polite and laugh off harassment at the hands of male professors. And this was a tool, a strategy, that she later applied in the field. Of course, there are more women and people of color in academia now than there were a few decades ago. But as we write about in the book, this has not dislodged the methodological expectations and epistemological standards that came out of cis white straight men's field work. Despite the training some had in feminist and other critical methods, when faced with harassment in the field, many participants reverted to epistemological assumptions rooted in, these, in, in the experiences and worldviews of cis white male men, or cis white male men, yes, yeah, cis white male heterosexual elites about how the construction of knowledge is supposed to proceed. Um, and so they might have this feminist background, but at the same time, when at these points of crisis, they kind of reverted to the, what their understandings of the hegemonic uh, standards for doing, um, for doing eth good ethnographic research um, are. So secondly, and really sort of an extension of the first point, concerns that the academic community might consider their research polluted or invalid led some of our participants to avoid talking openly about their experiences in the field altogether. And our participants use these words, invalid. They're gonna think my work is invalid if I tell them about what happened or that I did something wrong or, or that my research is polluted. Um, so Karina was conducting field work in Rwanda when a government official assaulted her in his office. Based on this experience and other sexualized interactions, as well as the general lack of security in the country, she eventually decided to change her dissertation topic altogether. She went for like an archival project. She just stopped doing field work. Um, However, when people asked her about that decision, she sticks to the political context. She says, you know, the political context was just really insecure. I decided that I needed to leave and do something else. And she talked about why she didn't talk about having uh, been assaulted and harassed in the field. She says, particularly as women, there's a lot of fear of being accused of overreacting or being too sensitive or, you know, the backlash. She added, there's this idea that if I talk about things that are quote unquote emotional or sexual in nature, that I'm not being professional. Many others echoed Karina's sentiments. Although gendered experiences and practices are diverse, they're also ordered by a script that's not written by the actors who perform them. In order, to prevent, in order to present themselves as professional, our participants felt that they could not risk sharing experiences that might evoke these traits in the minds of others. So this, self this silence is really in part self-imposed and it demonstrates the degree to which women scholars can sometimes consciously become carriers of a discourse that marginalizes their own experiences. Relatively few participants worried about adhering to positivist notions of objectivity per se. However, they did seem to have internalized a commitment to a disembodied notion of validity and the possibility of um, accessing quote unquote genuine data that combined with their experiences in academia led many to worry that talking about sexual harassment and other sexualized experiences during field work could result in peers and mentors deeming them incompetent or their research less valid. Now, I note that this in some sense was a self-imposed silence, but that's not to say that this is a misplaced worry. 
participants who, have, uh, who had discussed their experiences with their peers and advisors were sometimes supported. Um, frequently, though, they were judged negatively, and so we see that in the experience of Phoebe that I talked about earlier, whose advisor told her to suck it up, that it was just part of field work. Um, and we also see it in Lena, the Asian American student that I mentioned earlier, who was harassed by neo-Nazis on the street in East Germany, well, the former East Germany. Uh, she describes a peer telling her when she talked about this, uh, when, when she got back from her field work, telling her, you know, if you look scared, you will get harassed, as if it were her fault, again. And then Manira, who was a Muslim per participant um, who wore a hijab when she participated in a master's level class for which she interviewed a young man about his experiences in the foster system. He got, um, she had offered him a ride home and he got creepy on her, asking her to see, asking to see her hair, trying to touch her, and so forth. And she was supposed to do a second interview with him the next day, but she decided against it because, um, you know, she, she didn't like where things were going. And she discussed um, with me ex how, how it went when she explained having made this decision to her classmates. She said, one of my classmates who was in the Marines, and so he was very built, he was tall, he was intimidating to look at. He told me that this was bad research. He said, if I were in that situation, I would have gone to his house the next day. And I said, well, you're also like 100 pounds heavier than I am, and you can lift your own weight and then some. I'm, these are two different situations. Now, luckily, the professor backed Manira up, but the point remains. Her fellow students judged her on the basis of the mythical, intrepid um, ethnographer capable of a view from nowhere. He failed to take into account how race, religion, and gender all combined to structure this interaction in the field. Experiences like this drive home why women ethnographers might be resistant to talking openly about sexualization and gender-related safety issues in the field. They also suggest that their suspicions that their fortitude as ethnographers or the validity of their, of their research might be called into question are, in fact, well-founded. So, what are the implications of the three fixations for the construction of ethnographic research? Or for the construction of ethnographic knowledge, more generally, perhaps. I want to talk about just two. First, Becca and I suggest that, the in that interactions that bring sex, gender, and the body to the fore often become residual data or are ignored altogether. Most of our participants were absolutely blindsided by their experiences. And as a result, they tried to ignore or set them aside. So borrowing Joan Fujimura's term for the data that scientists misrecognize because they do not fit within their pre-established categories of analysis, we refer to these experiences as awkward surplus. Participants often describe sexual harassment and other sexualized interactions as just part of life as an ethnographer. It was something that was present and bothersome, but it was not necessarily examined reflexivity at all. Because these interactions don't seem directly relevant to research topics, they can be perceived as unimportant. In retrospect, however, experiences like these often shape the ethnographer's trust in her participants, as well as how she chooses to interact with them in the future. Allowing these interactions to be set aside meant that some research opportunities were unconsciously avoided. Less time was spent with certain participants, and research sites were removed in favor of others that felt safer. This need to push aside experiences often comes from the contradiction faced by feminist researchers who are taught to be reflexive, but also feel this pressure to do work that is judged as valid by their peers, many of whom do not share their epistemological assumptions. 
For many women ethnographers, this involves the atomizing experience of allowing themselves to be objectified by research participants while simultaneously suppressing that experience. Now, when participants did bring up experiences of harassment to advisors, peers, or colleagues, the responses that they received often fell within this awkward silence, uh, within this awkward surplus category, implicitly or, in, or explicitly encouraging them to simply ignore harassment. Participants recalled advisors again, like Phoebe telling them to suck it up or laughing at their stories as if they were just one more awkward moment that everybody faces in the field. Um, so these experiences reinforce the belief that harassment and sexualized interactions were par for the course but not pertinent to the work at hand. In this way, the fixations limit how we can theorize or understand our own experiences as part of the knowledge that we produce. So thinking then in terms of causes and consequences, the racist and heteropatriarchal assumptions that continue to inform ethnographic <coughs> standards and the academy more generally, of course, may lead to the repression of particular experiences in the field just as they per perpetuate the association of these experiences with polluted research, which then also reinforces wanting to ignore them, so it becomes a vicious cycle. Secondly, despite an emphasis within ethnography on reflexivity and positionality, we argue that the ongoing influence of these three fixations leads to really only superficial attention to the effects of the researcher's embodiment in the field. As Christine Kielanski has observed, it is as if the body, once acknowledged, can be written out of the work. This perfunctory approach to positionality has really important consequences for researchers and the production of ethnographic knowledge. When we write about race, class, and gender and sexuality in the field as obstacles over which we must prevail or set aside, we miss, as Kristen Schill and Christine Williams have written, the opportunity to reflect on how being a gender or race, class, and so forth outsider impacts the actual process of field research. Again, it's worth mentioning here, as Kimberly K. Hong and others have suggested, that it's people of color and women who are more likely to have their work questioned, often because of the particular ways in which they are embodied. So there can be a real risk in accounting for these issues in our texts. We seem to both expect others, you know, quote unquote others, to be more reflexive and then punish them for it when they are. The answer, though, I think, is not to jettison reflexivity, but to work to change prevailing standards that penalize those who can never mention, uh, measure up to the dominant archetype. In other words, as a mentor, a longtime mentor of mine put it when she read the conclusion to our book, feminist anti-racists need to seize control of the means of academic production. The incongruence between ethnographic standards and the embodied reality of fieldwork is elucidated then when we examine the experiences of those who have historically not been included in setting them. By fetishizing a particular type of ethnographic journey, the three fixations we have identified limit the ways in which we envision getting good data. This is a problem then of the logic of evaluation as well as an epistemic issue of what counts as valid ethnographic knowledge. Becca and I hope that this study will push all researchers to consider how their embodiment influences the data they collect and the relationships they build in the field. But we also call for ethnography as a field to stop fixating on danger, the solitary researcher, and intimacy above both safety and a more com complete and complex telling of the field. Now, in the book, we make some recommendations for change at the level of individual researchers, mentors, and methods teachers, as well as sort of at the collective institutional level. 
and I'm happy to talk about those specific recommendations in the Q&A. But I want to end um, by noting that we began this project before the Me Too movement became a national phenomenon. <laughs> And as we are now completing the book, the national conversation that has begun to take place on sexual harassment in the workplace has made it clear to us that we can and, and should invest in changes at the micro level, such as how we teach methods or how we write about our experiences in the field or how and what experiences we talk to our students about before they go into the field. Um, but ultimately, more systemic change is necessary. Nothing short of the transformation of the academic culture that perpetuates silence and inaction around these issues will do. So thanks, and I'll welcome your questions and conversation. You know, that's an interesting question. What we ran into more, so is because our, um, the people who we interviewed, you know, were self-selected. They were people who volunteered to be interviewed. And, you know, we interviewed 56 of them, but we actually had, like, maybe another 50 who we could have interviewed, you know, waiting in the wings. So there was a really good response to our call. So there were times that people said, okay, how do I want to talk about this? Because I have to talk about it in a way that um, the person, that my advisor won't be identifiable or my field site won't be identifiable. And so what we ended up doing is um, we ran all the excerpts, paraphrases, um, and, and you know, anecdotes that we ended up using in the book by our participants, um, because there were many who were nervous along, uh, along those lines. Um, and so we ran them by them to make sure that they were comfortable with the level of sort of anonymity that we had or uh, that we had tried to provide them. Um, but then the other interesting thing that happened along those lines is that a lot of times people had agreed to participate um, based on like one experience that stood out in their minds, but as they were talking to us, they were like, oh wait, but then this other thing happened too, and this other thing, and this other thing. And so it tended to like open up a watershed um, and, and led to people really like, like recognizing all of this awkward surplus that they had just set aside as irrelevant to their experiences as an ethnographer. You know, most of them, uh, most of them did not. And and uh, although, so we interviewed, um, it was either like seven or or nine men, and they taught. They were interesting because they helped us kind of clarify. We were we wanted to interview some men because we were like, you know, if we own. I mean, this sounds so positivist in a way, but we were just like sort of wanted to sort of test. Uh, it's so hard to talk about these things. We wanted to test out some of our assumptions and like try to figure out, you know, are we assuming that these things are related to gendered experiences in the field when maybe they're not? Um, and maybe all people face these things. But there were, you know, in fact, in fact, differences. So that when men had experiences with sexualization in their field site, you know, somebody hitting on them or something like that, especially if they were white men, they came at that from a position of power. So the implications of that interaction for their ongoing fieldwork were not the same as they were for women. Now that wasn't true for in the case of um, men who weren't white. Um, and that is something that, you know, either Beck and I or somebody else should should like do a bigger study on because I think um, I think that it's really important, um, it, you know. It, but it also points out our broader point that that we aren't looking at the experiences of women in the field to say that embodiment matters only for women, right? Like we are all embodied, we are all raced, we are all gendered. 
And we all, as ethnographers, if we want to do good work, should be thinking about that and accounting for how it shapes our field work as we do it and as we write it up. So we purposefully um, made, uh, constructed a sample, selected a sample among the people who were willing to be interviewed so that roughly half of them were doing their field work in um, the US and Europe, and roughly half were doing their research in other parts of the world. And then among the people doing research in the US and Europe, we also um, selected participants that would represent sort of variants in terms of, of like sort of the class setting that they were that they were um, working in. Because part of what we were worried about when we started the research is exactly what you're talking about. Like we don't want to reinforce either the notion that somehow the men in um, the contexts that are typically associated with academic, re uh, uh, economic research, um, ethnographic research are somehow um, more, more sexist, more likely to commit harassment. But we also didn't want to perpetuate the idea that this was only and all about like stupid, uh, like young women researchers going into the field and not knowing what they were in for. So we wanted to like avoid reinscribing both of those stereotypes. Um, and so, and, and so, yeah, we had people, um, it, like a part of what our data really showed is that this stuff happens everywhere. And sometimes cultural codes, lack of knowledge about cultural codes does enter into it, right? Like it can, that can be an issue in the field, but it happens in all places and to all sorts of, you know, differently embodied women. The, well, so they were like self-selected as people who were interested in talking um, about experiences of sexual harassment or sexualization. We use both those terms because a lot of our participants were like, well, I don't know what I experienced was, if I would really call it harassment, you know. Was, and, and, so, um, and so almost everybody in our sample had something that they wanted to talk to us about. You know, so our sample isn't a measure of how common this is. You know, we would have to do a survey to ascertain that. Um, but they did, um, you know, they did have really different types of experiences and they did have sort of different positions on how much it bothered them. Like, uh, you know, uh, some people are like, oh, it didn't really bother me at all. Like, this is just part of life. Those were sort of the minority. Most either found it, uh, said that it was something that they found annoying and, and hard to deal with. And then there was another group that found it debilitating to the point where they changed their pro either abandoned their projects altogether or changed them significantly. You know, it, like we had, I would say like most of them, one of the things that we talked about was, or that we sort of set as a condition for participating was having conducted field work within the past 10 years. Um, and that it's sort of not really purposefully, but it did end up in, with sort of a younger sample overall. But nonetheless, we did have a decent cohort of people who were associate professors and up. And what they tended to describe is not that it was less common the older they got, but that it... Um, they had better strategies overall for dealing with it, you know, or for like just sort of preventing it from happen happening um, from the very beginning. So one participant was doing, um, she wanted to do an ethnography of this like white guys bike riding group in like, rural Iowa, Iowa or something, yeah, and, and um, you know, in the middle of the country, and it was, and she really wanted in on this group, but every time she, like, like um, you know, and she, like, it was okay if she was riding with them or whatever, but, like, every interaction she had with them was 
like weird, like felt like they were, you know, coming on to her or they were like trying to block her. And it was, um, you know, she finally got to the point where she was like, I'm not doing it. I'm just quitting this project. I don't need to do this. I can do something else. But the interesting thing was is that she then um, told, like one of her grad students was looking for a master's project. And she said, and he was a guy, and she said, well, why don't you do this? And he did it, and his access was super smooth all the way through. So yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and then I'd like like people to tell me what you think of them, too, because this is, you know. We're, we have one more chance to look at the manuscript. Um, but the, but, so our individual level, sort of at the level of mentors, teachers of methods, as well as um, ethnographers, um, I think are, like, I would say that there are four. I, I like, have, I wrote down three of them, but then, um, the first, I think, and, and probably the most important is um, something that came up probably in every single interview we did, which was that our participants who experienced harassment in the field said, I just wish that this had been talked about. Like that in my methods classes or like in my conversations before I went into the field that like somebody had told me that this would probably happen or it might happen. And you know, often like what was interesting is that even those with feminist advisors said, you know, they didn't talk about it in my methods class or, you know, in my committee meetings before I went to the field and but like after I came back and told them what happened to me, they were like, "Oh yeah, that happened to me in the field too." You know, when I was a grad student and this is how I deal with it. Or, or whatever, and so really talking about it and actually like sort of, you know, not normalizing it in the negative sense, but normalizing it as like something that we talk about and care about and like want to sort of plan around, not that we think we can prevent it from happening, but that we're actually going to like talk about it, this happens during field work, was probably the most important thing that our participants um, wished had happened. Um, but then we also, uh, Becca and I also talk about um, actually writing ethnography and teaching students to write in a more embodied way, to value these experiences in the field as data, to not shove them aside as awkward surplus. Um, and so, you know, to, to kind of, Think about the ways that embodiment for all people, uh, for all ethnographers, creates opportunities and constraints in the field and actually shapes how the knowledge that we're producing develops over the course of our work. We also talk about collaboration um, and sort of rethinking, like really trying to dismantle this idea of the intre intrepid ethnographer going off into the field alone, including for dissertation projects. And like maybe this doesn't seem totally, you know, there's a lot of sort of details to think out there about what that might actually look like, but to think about collaborative projects, like, you know, and especially also to remember that many of the, you know, sort of classical ethnographies that are held up as, as you know, um, excellent and, and, and classics um, are, you know, written by, you know, white men, but white men who had like invisible wives or research assistants who were working with them the whole time in the field. And so like somehow that seems to, that fact seems to have like disappeared along with critiques of the, you know, or as a part of critiques of the colonialist nature of doing ethnography. So beginning to like not think about that type, not aim to do that type of exploitative um, collaboration in the field, but to sort of rethink like what collaborative ethnographic work would look like and not just for projects further down the line, like beginning with dissertation work. Um, and then finally, you know, self-care. And by self-care, like having students like have a plan that's not like a, that, that we don't like, 
like to sort of have a plan for how, or ideas. I don't want to like call it a plan because I don't really think like it's always possible to like have a contingent uh, plan for every single contingency that might happen in the field. But you know, who are your networks in the field? Who will you reach out to? Who are you going to be in touch with regularly, uh, both like in your field site and back at home? Who are the people you can call on if something happens? And who will check in with you to make sure that you're doing all right while you're doing field work? Stuff like that. But then um, also recognizing that you can abandon a project like so I really think that this is a part of, an important part of self-care in the field is is both like talking about like how projects can be adapted um, or if necessary abandoned altogether in when when things um, become you know unsafe or um, too damaging or too harmful in the field. So those are sort of individual level. The institutional level changes, I mean, these are things like, um, you know, so I mean, I think like these things go together, right? You know, so like when I say we need to seize control of the means of, um, of um, sort of academic production, like, you know, in a way that's true, like we have to change the standards. And changing the standards starts with beginning to talk, like, like, ending the silence around these issues, right? Like talking about it and saying like, you know, we're not gonna let it happen anymore. It involves taking on positions of influence and power. But it also, you know, involves collective reflexivity and reckoning with what are, what have been like the values and standards of our disciplines and whose um, who's work and experiences are actually represented in those dominant standards. And what can we do to change that? And so like actually having sort of a collective conversation around that. And that I think, you know, goes far beyond just ethnographic research. You know, these are the types of conversations that we need to be having at AAA, at ASA, and elsewhere about really, um, you know, changing the structure of of the academic workplace.